Well, welcome everybody. Uh, glad to be back with you. This is uh, again our Forerunner School, and the particular class that we're discussing right now is the theology of the bride. Uh, and so, this we'll be dealing today uh, with session eight. Uh, and I've done, I've divided session eight into two parts: part one and part two. Uh, and the overall theme of both sessions is the bride and the writings of Paul. Uh, as you, if you've been keeping up with the class, as you will know that we've kind of been going through the different places in the New Testament where the different authors uh, speak about the bride. We, we spent, I think, three sessions on uh, the book of Revelation dealing with uh, how the Revelation 2 and 3 deals with the bride, and then we looked at Revelation 19, 7 through uh, 8 and uh, then Revelation 19:11 through uh, 21 or so, the end of that session, and some other places. And then we looked at that, that last week of Jesus' earthly ministry where he had that triumphal entry riding on the, the donkey and then he taught and he cleansed the temple and he taught on various key important issues. And, uh, of course, uh, some of those issues, uh, really a predominant amount of that teaching was about the bride and making the bride ready. So we did that, had a session on uh, Matthew 22 and then another one on Matthew 24 uh, and 25. And so this, we're continuing that theme. In those teachings, we had really two objectives. We, the, the first objective was to, to look at these passages and to see, um, is everyone the, the eternal wife of the Lamb, the, the betrothed bride? Is every believer the eternal wife of the Lamb? Or is it, is it a, an eternal reward where those who make themselves ready become the eternal wife of Christ? So we've been looking at that and trying to answer that question. Uh, and then we've also been, as we looked at these same passages, been looking at uh, just what do they teach about the bride, about the bride making herself ready and different uh, issues and, and pursuits that need to be a part of our walk with the Lord in order to make us ready. So those two questions, uh, we kind of hit on those in each of these sessions. And in these next two sessions, we're going to do the same thing. In this part one of this session, uh, we're looking at, well, both sessions, we're looking at the bride and the writings of Paul, uh, you know, predominantly from Ephesians chapter 5, where he talks about the husband and the wife and, uh, and how that's a parallel between Christ and the church. So it's a bridal concept, uh, the marriage concept that he uses to define, to talk about Christ's relationship with his church. So we want to look at that. We're going to look at it from two perspectives. We're going to look at it uh, in this first part, uh, which is this session. We're going to look at it to answer that question. Does Paul, is Paul teaching that every born again believer is the eternal wife of Christ? Uh, or is it a reward? Um, uh, and so we'll, in a moment after a prayer, we'll dig into that. And then in the next session, part two of session eight, again looking at the bride and the writings of Paul, we'll be looking at what that, uh, specifically what Ephesians chapter five uh, teaches us about the bride and the bride making herself ready. So it's a very, uh, I really believe these two sessions are, are very important. Uh, again, the overall class is a theology of the bride and uh, if you are a forerunner and, uh, or a pastor and you are teaching about the bride needing to make herself ready, then it's very important that you understand Paul's approach because obviously Paul wrote uh, a majority of the New Testament, quite a bit of the New Testament. And so uh, very important that we understand his perspective on, on the bride. And so... That's what we're going to be dealing with in this first session. Like I said, we're going to we're going to try to answer that question. Uh, in Paul's writings, is he saying that every born again believer uh, is the bride of is the eternal bride of Christ or the eternal wife of Christ, or is it like we've talked about in the other sessions? Uh, is it uh, an eternal reward to become the eternal wife of Christ and other believers who? 
will go to heaven and have a, and and live throughout eternity may not be the wife of Christ, whereas a reward for those who make themselves ready as a bride. Of course, you'll you'll know if you've been watch following us. We've been teaching from the perspective that not every born again believer will be the eternal wife of Christ, only those who make themselves ready. Now, we taught that in, in, from the book of Revelation. We talk it from, taught it from uh, Matthew 22 and Matthew 24 and 25. And so it's very important uh, that we understand if, if, if it, that there must be a consistency in the scriptures. If, uh, if John taught it in Revelation and the words of Jesus taught this in the Gospels, that the bride has to make herself ready, uh, then obviously Paul could not have taught a different approach. There, would, there, there needs to be a consistency on that. And so we're going to come from that per perspective that uh, Paul's teachings uh, will uh, also support the idea that the bride has to make herself ready in order to be the eternal wife of Christ. But uh, we need to get into that to do it. So anyway, let's, let me pray. And then we'll uh, get into uh, teaching on this issue. Uh, Father, we thank you for the opportunity to do this. We thank you for those who have been so uh, willing to persevere and learn and study. And we ask, Father, for the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon this, that you would take me out of the way and that you would, uh, that you would flow through me and in me uh, to teach with authority and anointing in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. I'm actually going to deal predominantly with Ephesians chapter 5, but I do want to just highlight uh, one other passage of Scripture. So if you look at, the, because we're talking about the bride and the writings of Paul, not just Ephesians chapter 5, although Ephesians chapter 5 is by far the predominant place that he deals with this. But there's one, really one other place in scripture where he does uh, deal with a bridal uh, terminology per se. Uh, a lot of his scriptures touch on it, but this one is one where he talks about it uh, specifically. And that's 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, uh, where he says this, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband uh, to, uh, so that to Christ... I might present you as a pure virgin. Uh, and so he talked about the, the, the church believers being betrothed to Christ. And of course, we've spent a lot of time, especially in session two, dealing with this whole betrothal issue. And this is a key verse of scripture uh, that, that makes it very clear that when one is born again, they are betrothed to Christ. Uh, this verse of scripture doesn't really speak one way or the other about who is the eternal wife of Christ, but it does make a very powerful point uh, that as believers, when we're born again, we are betrothed to Christ. Now, Paul, when he was writing this, I don't think really was concerned uh, about uh, the, the bridal paradigm and the bridal understanding. That wasn't his predominant Point or predominant purpose in writing that because if you go right after that, he said, well, you know, I betrothed you to be a pure virgin, but I fear that you're being deceived and, and led away from that. So his point was not uh, to make a theological point about the bride, but to uh, caution uh, the, the Corinthian church there not to be drift, not to be seduced away from that purity and that simplicity of a devotion uh, to Christ. So that, I just wanted to touch on that because there really are basically two passages in Paul's writings that deal directly with the bride, this being one of them. And then the second one, which we'll spend predominantly, in fact, the rest of the time on, will be uh, Ephesians uh, chapter 5. So anyway, let's go on now to Ephesians chapter 5. Again, in this session, answering the question, uh, is everyone the bride is described in, in Ephesians uh, chapter 5. So let's, let's first, let me uh, read that uh, passage of scripture. Uh, starting with chapter 5, verse 25, and then we'll go through the end of the chapter. Uh, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. You see how... And you, as you read, see this, you'll see how he 
flows from husbands and wives to Christ and the church, back and forth there. And he's using marriage. He's making points about marriage for sure, but he's also using that to as an application or illustration of the relationship between Christ and his church. So that was 20, verse 25. Verse 26, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all of her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to also love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but he nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ also loved the church because we are members of his body. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh." Now, the mystery is great. I'm in verse 32 now. The mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects uh, her, uh, her husband. Um, so, you, you know, this, most of the commentators, when they, when they discuss this passage of Scripture speak about the entire church. You know, it says in the, in the passage that, that Christ will present to himself the church in all of her glory. So most of the commentators, when they, when they explain this passage of Scripture, would say that, there, that the entire church will be the eternal wife of Christ. They make no distinction between the wife, who, the, the bride who makes herself ready and the bride who may live in a, a passive pursuit of Christ. They make no distinction uh, in terms of the level of glory that they will be presented. In other words, the entire church, uh, and the assumption is that every believer uh, will be presented in a, in a level of glory so that the entire church would become the eternal wife of Christ. That's the, that's the approach of that. And I have to admit, when, I, when you first read that. I've listed some main reasons in the, in the notes here. You can go and look at them in more, a little more detail. But as you, as you look through that uh, passage, the initial assumption uh, is that, yes, he's, he's speaking about a husband and a wife. Uh, so it's a bridal context. It's a bridal context. And he's saying in that, that the, the church... Uh, will be presented to him in glory as a bride, as a bride. And so there, it comes across as though it's the entire church has an equal, every believer within the entire church has an equal relationship, at least in the context of being considered to be the eternal bride of, of Christ. Um, now, as you can imagine, uh, because if you've followed our teachings, our view is, uh, is different than that. We don't believe that every born-again believer will be the eternal wife of Christ. But I want to spend uh, the remainder of this part one session defending our position why I, I believe Paul's writings there is consistent, <coughs> excuse me, is consistent with what we have taught from the book of Revelation and what we've taught uh, from the gospel. So that's kind of the approach I'm going to take is a kind of an apologetic or defensive position to defend that that's not what Paul is writing about uh, in this section uh, of scripture. So let's, let's uh, begin with this. Um, our, expl our explanation, this is on page four in your notes, our explanation, our review begins with an understanding that Ephesians is the book in the Bible which explains in the greatest detail God's eternal purpose. And that the God's eternal purpose is another way of saying his vision for his creation. Uh, the book of Ephesians goes through that uh, in quite a bit of detail. So I want to start with just spending a minute or two in Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, if you are part of our Forerunner School, you've already taken... <clears throat> 
the Forerunner School class, the eternal blueprint, which goes into a lot of detail about, about God's eternal purpose. And you'll realize that in uh, God's eternal purpose, we have five aspects of it. And they are, just to summarize some of them at least, that Christ is pre preeminent. He's central in every aspect of all of creation. The, and out of his centrality, the Godhead uh, desired for uh, a family of mature sons uh, for the father and a, an equally yoked or prepared bride for Christ and a temple for the Holy Spirit. And so there's other aspects of that. But the part we want to focus on here is that in God's eternal purpose, which was established before the foundation uh, of the earth, that God, the, and God in, eternal, in an eternal council determined that Christ would have an equally yoked, prepared bride who is holy and blameless uh, before him. Now let's look at Ephesians 1 just for a minute. I'm not going to try to reteach that entire class of God's eternal blueprint. But if you look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, uh, you see that also we have obtained an inheritance um, having been predestined, part of the predestined plan not automatically taking place according to his purpose, his eternal purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. Uh, works all, he's working all things after the counsel of his will of his will. Now the counsel of his will, if you look at the meaning of that word in the Greek, uh, has the connotation of an eternal counsel, C-O-U-N-C-I-L, uh, the, the eternal counsel, where it was determined that that would be what God was working toward. And so that's the vision. Ephesians chapter 1 is the, is the laying out of the eternal purpose, the vision for God's creation and what he's working toward in the church age. Now you see as you go through the book of Ephesians, you see also <coughs> in Ephesians chapter 3, uh, verse 11, this was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we see, again, this theme of God's eternal purpose or eternal vision uh, to take place there. One other thing in chapter 1 that I want to point out, and then we'll go to chapter 5 here is in verse 4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. In other words, this council took place before there was ever a creation, before there was ever, Adam and Eve were ever created, before there was even a heaven. There was just strictly the Godhead dwelling together in love and in intimacy. Uh, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him uh, in love. We should be... Um, holy and blameless before him. Now, so chapter 1 lays out a vision for God's eternal purpose. Chapter 3 continues to mention that. The, the first part of the book, in fact, it lays out the vision that God has for that. Uh, and then if you go over to chapter 5, what do you see? You see Wives be subject to, verse 22, wives be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. Husbands is the head of the wife, etc. It goes on to that. And then in verse 24, he begins to introduce the church. But as the church is subject to Christ, also wives should be subject to their husbands and everything. And then in verse 25, he gets more and more into the church. Husbands, love your wife just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word. Listen to this. That he might present to himself the church in all of her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. That she should be holy and blameless. Now, so those are the same words that Paul wrote in chapter 1 as he defined uh, in a general sense, God's eternal purpose. And so what is happening here uh, is that in, uh, in chapter 5, 
Paul is laying out the vision. This is our interpretation. The vision for the entire church. Yes, it's God's plan. It's in God's eternal purpose. It is his plan and his desire that every, and every person would be born again. Uh, and that was necessary because of the fall that every person had to be born again. His desire, his vision, his plan, his purpose is that every born again believer would be born again uh, and that every born again believer who is uh, born again would be presented to Christ holy and blameless in all of her glory. That's his vision for doing that. Now, he's not saying that that's an automatic. That's the, this passage in chapter 5 doesn't say that this is automatically going to happen, that, that every born-again believer uh, will have the equal amount of glory. Every born-again uh, believer will be the, the exact measure of holiness and blamelessness without any kind of spot or wrinkle, uh, and that every born-again believer would be presented to Christ with an equal amount of glory. He's saying, this is the plan. This is the plan. And he's given some tools there. Uh, he's saying, uh, this is the plan. Uh, and uh, that he, he gave himself up for the bride. In other words, he came to earth and the cross, betrothed uh, the bride to himself and died for her, paying the dowry, the bridal dowry for her so that he might sanctify her. In other words, set her apart, progressively set her apart, uh, having cleansed her by the washing of the water of the word. Uh, so you see that, that he's giving her a, a way that she can be made into this glorious uh, bride, that he, might, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory. He, that's the desire, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she should be holy uh, and blameless. And so what we see there is that Ephesians chapter 5, uh, that Ephesians chapter 5 states God's eternal plan and purpose, that is his vision for the church to be a glorious bride without spot or wrinkle and to be holy uh, and blameless. Uh, and so I, I touched on some of these, but I listed in the notes six different um, points uh, that says it's, it's not an absolute reality, but it's God's vision. Uh, and let me just kind of touch on uh, this, reasons that it's God's vision. First, Paul uses the same phrase he used in chapter 1, which we mentioned that, that they would be holy and blameless. It's the same goal, not the same final result. The second point um, in a similar way to the first point, when Paul writes that Christ will present the church to himself in all her glory, he is not saying that every individual believer will be presented to him in the fullness of glory. Now, we'll see that in a moment when we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, because believers will be resurrected in a varying degree, greatly varying uh, degrees of glory. So he's not saying that all of that will be glory, but as you look at the corporate uh, the corporate church, as, as you envision it being resurrected, is a glorious, glorious entity who will be resurrected unto Christ. Now, the third reason why it's a vision and not an actuality is that Paul wrote that Christ gave himself up on the cross uh, for her, for the church, so that the church could be sanctified. Uh, the, the cross, he came to the cross, he, he went to the cross died for her, uh, and the purpose of that is that the bride could be sanctified. This suggests uh, that the glorification of the church will not be automatic, uh, but will be the result of the church submitting to the sanctification process. In other words, he died on the cross so that the sanctification process uh, could be enacted to make the church ready. Fourth one, uh, is that the work of sanctification will take place as Christ washes believers with the water of the word. This phrase suggests that individual believers must be cleansed initially through salvation, but also their life by encountering the word of God and responding to it uh, so that may, they may be made glorious as they progressively are washed by the water of the word. 
Uh, and then the fifth point, again from Ephesians 5, Paul, Paul wrote that Christ so loves the church that he nourishes and cherishes uh, the church. Now, we'll look at that in a little bit um, uh, later. We'll look at that in, actually in the next session, next part two, uh, about nourishing and cherishing uh, the church. But what that, what that in, entails, nourishing and cherishing, is that there's a tender love and a work, much like a father would raise up a child into maturity, that God leads and, and does uh, all of that uh, to bring the church to maturity. So there's a nourishing and a cherishing of the church. And the sixth reason uh, is that it calls individual believers to live in subjection to Christ and in reverence uh, to Christ. And we'll see that in the last verse of that chapter. We need to reverence him, not take Christ lightly, his scriptures lightly or him lightly and live any way we want to, but in reverence of, his, of who he is and the call upon us and the, and the intent of the scriptures. We need to reverence him and then live in subjection to him. And so from because of all those reasons in the in the context of the text, our view, our position is this that Ephesians chapter five uh, is essentially has the same approach as the book of Revelation and the Gospels in terms of calling the bride to be making herself ready. Now one thing, one maybe distinction uh, that we'll get into in the next part of this session, part two, is in Ephesians 5, we see the work of Christ to make the bride ready, uh, whereas the others kind of focus on the bride making herself ready. Uh, and both are necessary, but there, there is a major work of the Holy Spirit, the work of Christ, uh, who leads and we follow. And we'll see that in there. And I think in Ephesians chapter 5, we see that aspect of the readiness process uh, maybe more clearly than any other place uh, in the scriptures. So anyway, Ephesians 5 uh, supports this idea that the bride has to make herself ready. But there are other parts in the book of Ephesians that say uh, the similar types of things uh, that focus on the bride being made or making herself ready. In fact, going back to Ephesians chapter 1, because the whole book is about God's eternal plan and purpose. <clears throat> you know, in, in the first 11 verses, we've let God, Paul has laid out God's eternal plan uh, in initial form. And then you go to verse 15, just a few verses later, he says, For this reason I have heard of the faith of the Lord which exists among you in love for all the saints, and because of that, I do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. So what is he doing? He's praying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ would give them a spirit of wisdom and revelation of his eternal purpose and plan. And he's praying that the eyes of their heart may be opened, may be enlightened, so that they may know what is the hope of his calling, the, the etern calling of eternal purpose, the calling to be the bride made ready. Uh, and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance? So he's praying that they will have understanding of that. And then that chapter ends talking about Christ who's head over all th of things to the church, which is his body. The church is his body. The fullness of him who fills all in all. And he's talking about filling the church with a, with a revelation and insight in the character and the nature of Christ. So he, he's praying that they'll have insight into that so that they can walk uh, in that way. Uh, and, you know, there are other places, I'm not going to try to go through every place it speaks of these things, but you see again in, in Revelation chapter 3, uh, Paul has another prayer. Uh, he says, I bow my knees, verse 14, chapter 3, verse 14. Uh, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family, again, going back to the, the eternal purpose, the family in heaven and earth draws its name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through the Spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, 
and you'd be rooted and grounded in love and able to comprehend the breadth and depth and depth and depth of his love and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. So, you know, what he's saying, again, he's saying, you know, I'm praying that you have these insights so you can be filled up in order to live out the fullness of the vision that God has uh, for them. So again, we see vision requiring action. <clears throat> and then in uh, chapter 4, we see a little transition. Uh, you know, the first three chapters lay out the vision, um, and then with beginning with chapter 4, we begin to see uh, a response being initiated, a call for, in the people based on the vision. Um, verse four, chapter, chapter 4, verse 1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you have been called. In other words, the calling is God's eternal purpose. And he says, okay, I entreat you, walk in a manner worthy of this. And so then he goes through a whole list of different uh, things uh, that they need to, to walk in a manner worthy of them. It, it speaks of uh, different, the fivefold ministry and putting off the old self, putting on the new self, walking, uh, uh, you know, but not be angry, but do not sin. Uh, do not give the devil an opportunity. Don't steal. Um, you know, d just different things. Don't let any unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such word that edifies. Uh, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Uh, in chapter 5, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also walked in love. Don't let any, any, don't let immorality or any impurity, greed be named among you. Etc. And then he goes, you know, he goes on, he talks about the marriage relationship in, in chapter 5, which we've been considering. Chapter 6 deals with raising children and different issues as well as uh, spiritual warfare in chapter 6. So the whole book of Ephesians, he lays out a vision of God's eternal purpose, uh, including chapter 5, which lays out the vision of the bride being filled with glory. Uh, and then he lays out uh, a, a, a call to walk in a manner worthy of that vision. So he's not saying, again, in Ephesians 5, he's not saying that the entire church will be resurrected with an equal amount of glory uh, on every believer or that every believer would be the eternal wife of the Lamb. He's laying out the vision for that. Now, uh, and, that, and that's what we believe Ephesians speaks. Now, but there are other books. Uh, again, we're talking about the, all the writings of Paul, and obviously that's an extensive study to do that, but it will draw some, some scriptures from this. Uh, if you look at the other writings of Paul, they support this idea that the vision is for the, for the church to be resurrected in mighty glory, which would be a bridal nature, bridal glory, uh, but they have to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord in order to achieve this lofty goal. And so, you know, let's look for a minute at, the, uh, at, at Paul's prison epistles. You know, you, you know that Paul was in prison a couple of times, uh, uh, you know, in Rome. Uh, that first time he was in renting quarters in Rome. Uh, and while he was there, he wrote what are called the prison epistles, which are Ephesians was one of those. But also Philippians and Colossians were other, two other of the prison epistles. Now, Philemon as well, but Philemon's more of a personal nature. But if you look at Philippians and Colossians, if you look at Philippians and Colossians, what, you'll, what you will find is a similar type of, uh, of writing to, uh, in terms of fulfilling uh, the, the eternal purpose that God uh, has uh, for the people. Let's look at Philippians first for a minute. Uh, of course, there's a lot you could find there in the Philippians, but probably the predominant chapter there in Philippians um, the, the, is chapter 3. We could start with about verse 10. Uh, he said that I may, you know, he, he had talked about his own personal walk, and, but he said, I, I throw all that away to, to be found in Christ. He said that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Why? 
in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not the, and then he says, this is Paul. Now this, the prison epistles were written <coughs> toward the end of his life. I mean, they were written just, just a few short years before he uh, went to be with the Lord. It says, not that I have already obtained it uh, or have become perfect or mature, but I press on in order that I may lay hold of that for which I was laid hold of by Christ. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. Therefore, as many as are perfect, or any, as many as that are mature, have this same attitude, and if anything different, God will reveal it to you. And so, let me grab a little water here. So, the point, uh, the point he is making there in Philippians is that I don't think I've attained what all that I need to attain. I want the I want the upward call in Christ. I want the high call in Christ. Paul is saying this, and I press on toward this goal. And so, you know, he's not saying in Ephesians five that it's automatic. He's saying you've got to press on toward this. Uh, toward this goal. And the upward call, more, he doesn't mention the bride here, but of course the upward call in Christ would be the ultimate of reward and the, you know, the bride made ready would be a, a part of that. Now we also see in Ephesians 2, let's start with about verse 12. So then my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation when fear, in fear, with fear, and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And so what is he saying? He's saying, I've laid out, in Ephesians, he lays out the vision, but he's, in Philippians, he's saying, you know, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. In other words, pursue all these things, just as he talked about uh, in Ephesians chapter 3. So we see that in Philippians. Now let's look also in Colossians. And what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to say that <coughs> Ephesians chapter 5 presents the vision. But if you consult, if you accompany all what he says there with all of Paul's writings, you see a, a radical pursuit of maturity uh, that, call, that Paul is called to. Uh, and we see this in, in Colossians. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 28 and 29, it says, We proclaim him, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we might present everyone mature in Christ. We might present everyone mature in Christ. And how does he do that? He warns them. And when, some, when, some, when, when an apostle warns us of something and it's an accurate uh, portrayal, of what Christ is saying, we need to be obedient to that. And then he teaches everyone with all wisdom so that he can present everybody mature in Christ. And he says, for this I toil, struggling with all the energy that he powerfully works within me. And so we see again this uh, radical pursuit, uh, this radical pursuit of the, the lofty vision of being presented in all of the glory. Um, Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, we see a similar kind of thing. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, greed, which amounts to idolatry, for it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come. So anyway, he goes on. Uh, Colossians 1, 9 is a prayer, the apostolic prayer that Paul prays. For this reason, since the day I've heard about it, we have not ceased to pray for you to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Why? So that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in every respect, to bear fruit in every good work and increase in the knowledge of God. So again, we see, we see as in Philippians and Colossians, which are written all about the same time as Ephesians, 
that he's accompanying this lofty vision of Ephesians with a call to press, press on uh, toward maturity. Uh, but it's not only the prison epistles. We see it also in Paul's earlier epistles, earlier writings. Uh, you know, a major one is uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15. Um, and this is a really important um, scripture as well. There's a discussion going on about the... Um, about the uh, resurrection. I can see if I can find it here. Uh, can't find it in there, but I, I'll, I'll just look it up in the scriptures. Uh, there, there is a, there, in 1 Corinthians 15, they're discussing the resurrection. And some are saying there's no resurrection, and then Paul goes on. But then in the midst of that, he explains the resurrection. Uh, and so he says this. Uh, there it says, all, first, starting with verse, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 39. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another flesh of birds, and another of fish. There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. But the glory of the heavenly is one, and the glory of the earthly is another. And there is one, and listen to this, there is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for stars, for star differs from star in glory. Remember Ephesians 5, he's talking about the church being resurrected in glory. Uh, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body, it is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in weakness, it is raised, it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. So here's the point, though, for what we're talking about here. He speaks there. He says, okay, the resurrection of the dead, looking at individual believers, some are resurrected with a glory like the sun. Some are resurrected with a glory like the moon. Others are resurrected like a glory of the star, but some are like a bright star and some like a faintly dim star. So he's not saying like he said, like we may have thought in Ephesians 5, that everybody, every individual believer comes forth with the same level of glory. It's not that. They're the corporate uh, picture of the resurrected bride at the second coming of Christ is a glorious church being res resurrected. But each individual believer contributes to that, but in varying degrees of, of level of glory. Uh, and some of those would not be a glorious bride. They would be a level of glory, uh, but not to the level of being uh, the bride. So we see that in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 15. Um, Paul's description of the judgment seat of Christ uh, also parallels this or supports this idea of different levels of glory. You know, in both 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12, and 2 Corinthians 5, verse 9, he speaks of the judgment seat of Christ. And he talks, I'll just read uh, the first one from 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15. Uh, now, if any man builds on the foundation of gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it, the day of judgment, the day that Christ is presented the church to himself because it is to be revealed with fire and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved yet as through, as through fire. Uh, and so again, a different levels of resurrection uh, quality of resurrection as we look at the individual uh, life of, of believers. And so we see that. Uh, Paul also wrote about believers, need for believers to pursue being clothed in garments of righteousness. Now, remember, you'll remember from Revelation uh, and uh, Matthew 22 as well, where the, you know, the, the man was kicked out of the... Uh, wedding feast, marriage supper because he didn't have on wedding garments and uh, 
The bride has made herself ready. She was called to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and clean, and she put that uh, linen on. It was granted to her. Um, so uh, we see, you know, so there's a, there's a picture of the bride being clothed in, in garments. Uh, and so we see that in Paul's writings uh, where, uh, you know, he, he is, he's talked about the need to be clothed in, in uh, being clothed with Christ and clothed with righteousness. I, I love this passage of scripture <coughs> in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed, listen to this, for indeed in this house, our earthly house, we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. Longing to be clothed with with bridal, or no, it doesn't say bridal, but with heavenly garments. Inasmuch as we having put it on will not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave us the Spirit as a pledge. And so you see what Paul is saying, groan, cry out for your bridal garments, for you to be clothed in Christ, clothed with, uh, with the character and the, and the nature and the righteousness of Christ. And of course, there are a lot of other passages, just a few other in the notes, but in Romans 13, 14, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. Ephesians 4.24, and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness uh, and holiness of the truth. Uh, and so we see that in, in, in many of his writings where he's talking about being clothed with Christ, being clothed with righteousness, with, with godly character. Uh, and so the point of all this is that he's not saying we automatically have on these garments of, of righteousness. We, we, there's a, there is definitely an imputed righteousness which comes when we're born again, but we also have to put on the, the, the nature of Christ throughout our life so that we might be clothed in him uh, to become this glorious uh, bride without spot or wrinkle. Um, you know, other things... Paul uses the idea of I've been crucified with Christ to describe how a believer is conformed into the image of Christ. He's talking about the fact that we need to, to embrace the cross, to go to the cross, to allow the cross to work in our life, to transform us into the image uh, of Christ. And so, and so finally, again in Paul's writings, Paul writes that he himself could be disqualified from the high calling of God. Uh, and this is always a scary verse for me, and I meditate on it periodically, but it's a very important verse of Scripture. 1 Corinthians 9, 26 and 27. Paul said, I run in such a way is not without aim. I box in such a way is not beating the air. Uh, but I discipline my body and I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself would not be disqualified. Now, what, what's he talking about disqualified? I don't think he's talking about disqualified from salvation. He's disqualified from the high calling of God, the bridal relationship, the high calling, the highest level of eternity. Remember, he had been caught up to heaven and he had seen the different levels of glory and he knew of all those things. And he says, I don't want to be disqualified. Now, that should be a frightening verse of scripture uh, for all of us as pastors and, and as leaders in the body of Christ. We don't want to preach to others these things and not pursue them ourselves in order to be made ready because we don't want to be disqualified. And Paul wrote that uh, as well about himself. Um, and so, uh, you know, we see, we see in all of his writings, again, we're, what we're trying to do is answer the question, does Paul say, especially in Ephesians chapter 5, does he write there, 
that when the church will be presented in glory without spot or wrinkle uh, and blameless and holy, is he saying that every born again believer will be that by the mere fact of being born again and that there's no radical pursuit needed to make ourselves ready. And so that's the question. Uh, and even though uh, as a cursory uh, look, an, an initial look, it seems like a, that passage kind of says that, as you begin to really dig into it, you see that no, it doesn't say that at all. What it says is that that's the vision God has for his church to present his church in all of her glory, include every believer, every person ever created. That's his desire. That's what he wants. That's the eternal purpose of God. But in order to do that, there's a radical pursuit of that that is needed uh, to do that. There's a, and, and he's provided everything that he needs. He's, he's, he loves us. He's died on the cross for us that he might sanctify us. Uh, that he might, he's provided us with the washing of the water of the word, that he might cleanse us, he loves us, he cherishes us, he nurtures, nourishes us. He does everything he can uh, to make us ready. But we must respond to his loving leadership if we want to be made ready. So in this first part of this session, I want to conclude it with, it, with this, that Ephesians chapter 5 does not say that every born-again believer will be resurrected with an equal amount of glory, that every born-again believer will be the eternal wife of Christ. He's saying this is, the, this is the plan, this is the vision, but radically pursue being made ready in order that it might be a reality in your own life, in your own life, and in my own life. So we'll pray here to conclude this session, and then in part two, we'll deal with what powerful truths does this passage in Ephesians 5 teach us, which are really many wonderful and great truths, and we'll look at those in just a minute. So, Father, help us all to pursue being made ready, to know the wonderful grace, the wonderful mercy, the wonderful love that you have for us. We ask that you will make us all ready in the name of Jesus, amen, amen.